Hey everyone, I'm Jack from Riverjack Studio, and in this video I take a leftover walnut slab and some quarter inch steel to make a custom one-off coffee table. Please like, comment, and subscribe for more upcoming videos. So I previously had this two inch thick walnut slab from a local tree and ended up using the majority of it on these side tables I made about a year ago. I used black epoxy to fill the cracks and knot holes and they turned out great so I figured it wouldn't hurt to try and do something in similar fashion with the piece that I had left over. The section that I had left over had quite a large crack and knot hole, and this was due to it being at the crotch of the tree where a branch had formed. It had pretty extensive curling from the pressure that was exerted on the trunk of the tree, which you'll be able to see better later on. So my first step is to just go ahead and seal everything up to use epoxy on the cracks and knot holes. This is actually one of my better sealing jobs. I have probably had hundreds of dollars of epoxy spill on me over the couple of years that I've been trying my hand at woodworking. I don't think I've had one epoxy project where there wasn't at least one leak. It does help tremendously when the bottom of the piece you are working with is flat and the crack doesn't go all the way through. So I just quickly added some caulking to the side of a piece of Tyvek tape and put that on some plywood. And then I sealed the wood with shellac to make sure the epoxy doesn't stay in the wood. I usually use epoxy on cedar pieces, which some of you might have seen in my first ever YouTube video that I posted. Cedar is far more porous and will soak up the epoxy if it isn't sealed, which discolors it within the first quarter inch to half inch or so. I learned this the hard way, unfortunately, and had to redo several projects that I had started beforehand. Walnut usually isn't too bad about soaking in epoxy, even when it's jet black like the color I'm using here. Still, I don't want to make the piece any thinner to get rid of the potential staining, so I just go ahead and make sure everything's properly done. I meant to just add 20 drops of dye to get the correct blackness, um, but instead I ended up squirting a whole bunch of dye into there, so oh well, it'll just be extra black. This would be a problem if I was making more than one batch, but since this will just be a single pour, I'll be okay. I just ended up throwing a plastic bag over the top of the piece while the epoxy cured over the next couple of days so that no dust or debris get in there when it's curing. I used to do a really good job of chiseling off all the caulking before flattening my pieces again, but I never found my bits dull quicker leaving it on there, and honestly being lazy and not removing it all of it saves me an extra 45 minutes or so. So I just hit a couple high spots with the router and I go off and flatten the whole piece. I hot glue it down just to make sure it's as level as possible and doesn't move around when using my router, and then I take it and take about a sixteenth of an inch off every single pass. It only takes about two passes or so on each side and I end up taking off about four passes in total. I made this flattening sled about two years ago using some three quarter inch plywood and even put a leaf in the middle of it to make it a bit wider about a year ago. It's honestly lasted a lot longer than I expected and I use it just about weekly. Using a straight edge and a digital caliper to measure peak to valley is about a 64th of an inch, which I think is more than acceptable for a tabletop. After flattening both sides, I then chisel my piece out of the hot glue using my custom mallet I made two videos ago, which is a shameless plug to get you all to go watch the rest of my videos. And then I take it out back to the shop and get ready to route it into a circle. I go ahead and set up my router on a circle jig with a rabbiting bit to turn my somewhat square chunk of walnut into a circle. I measure out the diameter and then I get my radius from that so I know where to line up my pin which centers the jig in the piece. I hammer it in and then sweep it around to make sure all my clearances were correct. Using the plunge cut base, I take about an eighth of an inch cut and swing the route around dropping it each rotation. I do about 80% to 90% of the way through the piece before stopping so I don't get any tear out. I originally thought about keeping it live edge and just cleaning up the sides to kind of maximize the surface area that I had since this piece was going to be so small, but I just didn't think it would look good as a short stubby live edge piece. After I was done routing out most of the way, I flipped it over and then used my jigsaw to cut the rest of the excess walnut off. I then take a flush cut bit and route the rest of the excess material off that I had missed using my jigsaw. I then needed to decide on an edge profile. I really like using a chamfer on all my work. I don't know why, but when I use dimensional lumber, it feels like an angled edge just looks a lot better and gives more dimension to it. But because I just cut this into a giant circle, I figured I should probably use a round over bit. So I decided using a 3 8 on the top and then a quarter on the bottom to give it a little more heft to it and make it a little larger than it actually is. And now my circle has gotten more circular. 
I would now start the finishing phase, but before I could, I needed to fix an issue you might have questioned earlier, and that was the indent from the prong that held my circle jig in place. To fix this, I would just take a chisel and going along the grain, I would split the wood fibers to open them up. I would then take some wood glue and smear it in into the little slices I just made. And then using a sander with 60 grit, I would go over and the sawdust and the glue would fill the void and none would be the wiser. Except you all, of course, because I just showed you. <laughs> Luckily, I did do a bit of planning, which is surprising even for me. And I made sure to blend it in well and that it will be on the bottom side, which will be covered up by the table base eventually. I then start sanding the whole piece, starting at 60 grit, twice to make sure my router marks and anything else that was from the flattening stage are removed properly, making sure to pop the grain in between sanding grits. I then moved on to 80, and then after 80 grit, I needed to address some of the small pits in the epoxy that were chipped out from me flattening it. Some bubbles stay trapped in the epoxy while it's curing and are exposed after the flattening process. So I take some black CA glue and carefully add it to the pitted spots and then use an activator to harden it. I love CA glue. The first time I ever used it was to actually fix a girl I was seeing cabinet door that she broke off. She was leaning on it and then the frame of the door broke and it was some cheap thin plywood that was rampant in her crappy apartment complex. She was super worried about losing her deposit and I'm a sucker. So I told her I'd fix it. It was a little too thin to use wood glue and I couldn't get a clamp on anywhere because it was just so thin and it kept on wanting to pop up even at the joint. So I had to come up with another way to put it back together. After doing a couple of YouTube video searches, I stumbled upon CA glue, a super glue that hardens within 10 seconds using a hardener, which I thought would be pretty decent and it said it bonds really well. So I hopped and skipped over to Lowe's and bought some. I applied the uh, CA glue to one side of the joint and then the hardener to the other and then I just slid them together and to my amazement it looked like it was never broken. I then just zipped the door back on to the hinges and the slumlords were none the wiser. I definitely got some brownie points for that. Honestly that might have been a mistake because then a roommate started getting me to fix all the other things around their apartment. Because I was saying the best way to make friends is to own a truck and trailer. I think the same thing could probably be said for fixing things for broke college students. But. Anyway, back to the actual woodworking video. So then after I fixed all of the small spots and went through and sanded everything, I go all the way up to 320. Then using mineral spirits to remove all the dust and debris caught between the grain. And then after that's dried, I add a two-part wood finish Rubio Monocoat and then apply that wax to the top. And then after that satin cured for I think it was three days, I then add a finished coat and then let that sit and cure as well. So the tabletop's final dimensions come at 22 inches wide and about one and three quarter inches thick, which does seem quite small, but then I remembered my first apartment in college and how small my living space was. My first college apartment was a one bedroom over a two car garage. It was like a carriage house. And when I first moved in there, there was actually two of us living there. I slept in the bedroom and my friend Bo slept in the kitchen the kitchen. <laughs> he was already sleeping in the kitchen when I moved in actually. Why? That's a good question. I have no idea why. I still question to why he was living in the kitchen room when I moved in. Um, rent was $300 though. And so with $300, you don't ask any questions. We couldn't even fit a full size couch in our living room. I, we got a love seat and that was the extent of our home furnishings. So it would have been really nice to have this little table to set drinks down on and had people over they could set their stuff on. So hopefully whoever buys this thinks the exact same thing as me. So now that the top is done, I need to move on to make the table base. I really enjoy three leg table bases for small pieces. I think the odd number of legs looks better dimensionally and then it's also self leveling so you don't have to worry about tolerances too much. I did want to make it a little more beefy than the normal like hairpin legs you see because I didn't want the top to out proportion the legs. So I decided on getting some flat steel and making three leg like frame type design which you'll see coming up. I ran over to my metal yard and then they cut me some three inch by quarter flat steel. And I just asked them to cut it into three pieces and I'd figure out my dimensions later on, which will be my saving grace because I'm glad I asked them to get more steel than I actually needed because I screwed this up a couple times. I first make a template out of a scrap piece of plywood with a 30 degree angle so that the three pieces will be spaced perfectly apart when cut. I then scribe a line on that angle and then cut off the material using the cutoff wheel on my grinder. I then line them up on my somewhat 
flat garage floor and then grab my Amazon special flux core welder. First off, let me start by saying I am not a good welder. 95% of everything I've welded before was stick and it was in the field while I was working for a nature preserve in college. So I quite literally just ground down a spot, cranked the amperage and shoved a 7010 rod in the crack and then hoped for the best on all the farm equipment and everything I was working on. I am a Neanderthal when it comes to welding. So using the flex core and then having this prepped was a little different than what I'm used to. So I did a bunch of practice runs and was really careful with my prep before starting. But even after all that, I will still find a way to screw this up somehow, trust me. <laughs> For instance, what I should have done was ground down the edge profile of the steel bars so I would have not had a pooling area on top with the flux. That metal pooling isn't a huge deal, but it will cause me to have to spend a lot more time sanding it down later on. I ended up finishing out my welds and not too shabby if I say so myself, and then I move on trying to bend my pieces and get a curved edge profile. This is where I start to have some problems. You can see I finished my welds up as my dad walks by and I explain to him my thought process on everything and how I'm going to do it. And uh, he looks pretty puzzled and <laughs> pretty much tells me that it's not going to work. And my thoughts is, well, what do dads know anyway? Am I right? So I go off and then I'm ignorant of my future problems. I did not have an acetylene torch in my house, which burns much hotter than a good propane tip torch. And I only have a small torch head to go on a small bottle of propane which I try to use along with some leverage to bend my pieces properly, which does not go well at all. I ended up bending it with pure mechanical leverage and the heat didn't seem to help at all, which in turn made my bends all wonky and my base not flat anymore. And this is where I <laughs> decide to reconsider my approach. I decided just to go ahead and cut out my section of welding and then flatten the pieces and retry using a vise this time. I have been both incredibly busy and incredibly lazy these past several months. It's a real talent of mine. So instead of just stopping and coming up with a better idea, I just tried to reset and use the same method, just slightly differently. I'm very stubborn that way. Another example of this is me applying for research grants and fellowships that I'm trying to use to pursue a master's degree this coming fall. And recently I completed a research fellowship application that was only supposed to be five pages long. Um, but it was also included a very detailed research proposal, which in my mind, I thought would only take three days to type up. In reality, it took me over two weeks to finish. It's honestly one of my biggest strengths and biggest weaknesses all at the same time. I am so confident in trying and accomplishing anything, but on the other hand, I also vastly underestimate the time that I'll need to do and complete these projects. So that's why you guys get a video four months after the last one, three months after the last one. So I recut everything and scribe a line where I'm going to make my bins. I try heating it up again and using a hammer to make my bin while it's in the vise, but that still didn't work. So then I try and make a relief cut in the steel on my bin line and heat it up again. And some of you might know where this is going. I give it a couple of light taps and snap. Broke the piece off. So I decided to go ahead and give up that day and I went ahead and just cut all my pieces to length and then I decided to weld up all my joints instead of trying to bend everything because clearly that was not going to work. I ended up prepping all my pieces again and then welding up the bottom of the base and then using a little template to make sure everything was evenly spaced. And then after that was done I welded up the sides and then eventually welding up the top as well to make the whole base complete. Probably my favorite thing about this project is that I thought this base was going to take like four hours tops to finish. And then four hours basically turned into two days very quickly. So I don't know. At least I got it done. I blame my first ever real boss for kind of spurring this on. I did landscaping in high school and my boss was a big supporter of the figure it out as you go along school of thought. I remember one day on the job he had brought me along to dig out some footers. Uh, that we were going to pour later on that week. And he told me to go get a backhoe off the trailer and start digging where he had marked with flagging and paint while he left to go, quote, another project. I was, like, absolutely dumbfounded and a little lethargic at 7 o'clock in the morning. I didn't know how to drive a backhoe. I didn't even have a driver's license at that point. And he, I remember he told me, you'll figure it out. And that was all my 14-year-old brain needed to hear at that point. And I skipped and glided right on over to the backhoe Got it off the trailer, no incidents, and not a care in the world, nor an adult in sight, and began digging out some of the footers. My boss did come back eventually, and funnily enough, I didn't destroy or break anything, and was even told I did a good job. So that, ladies and gentlemen, was an ego boost a 14-year-old boy in high school did not need. 
and I have been a maniac ever since. Finishing up all the welds, I take a flat disc and run over everything and ground down my welds that were a little proud on the surface, along with getting rid of any of the mill scale left over, which is that gray oxidation you see on the surface. And that'll really affect the primer and you can't have that on there when you're painting. So I go ahead and take that 36 grit flat disc and go over everything really quickly. I then take it over to my workbench and using my regular finish sander up to about 220 grit, I have a nice flat surface for paint. And the sandpaper I use is the aluminum oxide one, um, which is the cheap stuff you can get at Lowe's, but it can be used on metal as well because of that, as well as the wood surfaces. I'm now ready for paint. Um, I was deciding on the color and I figured black since that was the color of my epoxy and I didn't want to do anything too shiny. So I just settled on a satin black, which is honestly most of the stuff I paint when I'm doing table bases or even a, a bike frame or anything like that. And the rattle can that I got from Lowe's is self priming too. So I just have to spray it on and I don't have to add primer or anything. I sprayed my first coat and I put it on a little thick in one spot and I had a couple runs so I just took some thousand grit wet sandpaper and removed the top layer of paint. And after spraying several light coats I was now ready to joint the top to the base. When I've done pin legs on coffee tables in the past I add inserts into the wood to be able to remove the legs so it's easier for shipping. But because this is just a large single piece base I just decided to screw it directly to the top. I mark out my spots and use a scratch all to center my drill bit and make my holes. So I know it's been a while since my last post and I promise I have more videos upcoming. It's really just been one thing after another. I have five project videos already filmed and I really just need to sit down and take the time and edit and upload. Hopefully I'm gonna be coming every Thursday like this video is uploaded and I'll have some in the future at least for the next month or two and hopefully I can keep up that pace. I then go back with a countersink bit uh, so my screws will sit flush underneath. I then center the base and pre-drill my holes into the top of it too. And I also added some felt pads not only in between the base and the top so there's no friction or rubbing between the two but also on the bottom. After jumping back and forth with a straight edge making sure that I have this thing perfectly centered on there I then go ahead and shoot my painted screws in and it is done. And now for some beauty shots of this thing. So this piece is for sale and it's listed on my Etsy, which is linked below. And I also have some other pieces on there if anyone's interested from cutting boards and other tables that I've done. Let me know what you all think. Uh, please like, comment, and subscribe down below. Uh, thank you all so much for watching and hopefully I will see you all next week.